My name is Rick Happy. I'm the chair of CCS. We want to welcome everybody to our presentation on elevating fundraising. As it's, we're well into back to school time, we think it makes sense to think about what we've learned in the last year and how we might adjust our strategies going forward. We think of ourselves at CCS as strategic advisors and implementers of philanthropic solutions. And we're delighted that you've all joined us today uh, for this webinar. We um, have a chat box that we encourage you to put questions into as we move through the presentation. And uh, let me uh, uh, introduce my co-presenter and talk a little bit about uh, CCS. So joining me as co-presenter is Sarah Crazen. Sarah is a partner with the firm, a managing director. She leads our uh, Boston office and she's been with CCS now for almost 14 years. Sarah and I work really closely together in the Western United States. I'm domiciled in San Francisco, and we have a, a great history together. And I know she is looking forward to this um, presentation as she will be doing the bulk of um, our uh, work this afternoon or this morning or this evening, wherever you are. Let me tell you a little bit about CCS, um, and then we'll dive into the presentation today. We are a 76-year-old um, fundraising consulting firm. We um, have are a global firm, but we are really steeped in local, uh, our local perspectives. We have 18 offices around the country and we have about 700 client partnerships on an annual basis, 525 professional staff. And we work across the philanthropic spectrum. So we work in education, healthcare, religion, the environment and conservation, arts and culture, civic, social service, human service. Um, let me just tell, talk a little bit about today's discussion. We really see, uh, we want to talk about the four key pillars in fundraising. We want to talk about our top five challenges that we're seeing now, suggested strategies and tactics, and applicable takeaways. I'm going to talk about the four key pillars, and then Sarah will talk about the challenges, the suggested strategies, and the applicable takeaways. So let me start with the four key pillars in fundraising. And at CCS, you know, we've really uh, think about this applies to every sort of fundraising effort and endeavor um, that organizations are engaged in annual capital endowment, you name it. There are really four critical pieces to every successful campaign, every successful fundraising endeavor, your case for support. Why are you doing this? And what are, what are you trying to raise money for your leadership? Who is advocating for the organization and what you're trying to do? The prospective donor universe, who is your natural constituency, and the plan to raise the money, personal approach, a uh, your strategy, and an emphasis, given the data that we're seeing over the past several decades on major gifts. Let me start with the case for support. The case, you know, is really the story of the need. It's the primary tool to elevate giving and to inspire donors. You know, sometimes this may be a glossy document or brochure. But you don't have to have the physical document in front of you to articulate the need in a compelling way. You know, this really it, it comes around several things, big ideas outside of the normal cycle. What are what are what are donors asking for and what are they saying? Um, we really see this comes through several things, impactful goals a clear, and a clear vision that encompass a compelling case. We know that donors believe that um, impact is their number one uh, motivator for giving. Let's talk about leadership. Of these four pillars, leadership is the most important element in any effort. You could have the most wonderful case in the world, but if you have middling or uncommitted leadership, it becomes that more that much more challenging. Uh, conversely, if you have very strong and committed leadership, any effort that you undertake will be or should be successful. And what we're looking for from leadership is not just the development office or the advancement office, or not just the CEO's office, the head of school um, or the executive director, not just the board of trustees, the board of directors, not just the staff or the faculty or the physicians or the, uh, the conservationists. It really is a shared effort. It is a culture of philanthropy where leadership is something that is shared across the organization. And what's critical, the critical roles that leaders play are advocating passionately for what you're trying to do as an organization, engaging deeply, giving, and really being that expert uh, in some role or capacity that people rely on and, and as a go-to for your um, success. 
Now, who do you ask? Who are your prospective donors? Who should you prioritize? How should you prioritize? The best prospects, first of all, what's the best prospect? The best prospect prospects are those who are closest to your organization, your board members, your donors who give to you on a regular basis. Hopefully that's the largest donors first and quote, the best donors by constituency. Our experience tells us that working inside out, those giving, those who are your closest friends and supporters first, then membership, past donors, and finally the general public. And the circle um, to the far right of the screen, you can see what this looks like and how to work in to out. Now, we know in philanthropy, there's been a lot of changes over the last several decades. We are seeing, and this is an unfortunate trend, we believe, fewer and fewer donors nationally, but more money still being raised. So there's pressure on major donors to give. We are seeing fewer donors across the board. So engaging people closely is critical to any organization's success. I spoke earlier about how donors uh, um, impact is the number one motivator for major donors. And 62% of wealthy individuals cite being asked as their primary reason for giving. So what does that mean? That means that they, you need to invite people, you need to engage people, you need to ask people to give, and you just can't rely on them giving out of the goodness of their hearts without having the, um, the case explained or the organization's mission made clear to them. Donors, um, and finally, talking about what how we'd see um, what what the uh, where you turn prospects into donors is really about building relationships. You know, engaging them early on, nurturing them, and then stewarding them. I think one of the things that we find in philanthropy is that it is not a straight line in terms of donors who give and you identify, engage, give, and that's the end of it. It really is a circle. And stewardship is critical. One of the top reasons donors stop giving to an organization, and this has been true for many, many years, is that they, quote, no longer feel personally connected to the organization. So they haven't been stewarded, they haven't been engaged, and they just slip away and they reprioritize their philanthropy. One way we think that's very um, interesting and useful about stewarding donors is that if you get your donors to make and consider or to make a legacy commitment, uh, a bequest intention, um, a, a, tr a, a charitable remainder trust, so, uh, some kind of gift planning vehicle, average annual giving increases by 75%. So think about that as a way to help engage donors and steward donors um, so that you don't lose them uh, after time. And finally, the plan itself. So the plan really is a, blue, a blueprint for raising money for any organization. And that includes really critical pieces, your goals, your timeline, who are your audiences? Again, I talked about the case and leadership, but other things that are really critical, your communication strategy. When do we go public? How do we announce this? Gift recognition. There's been real shifts in recognition over the last several years. Is it something that's appropriate for our, or for our organization um, in 2023? Making investments in raising the money through budget, staffing, resources. Um, raising money requires that. It's not just a matter of somebody else doing an extra job. And finally, the key strategies that your leadership is going to carry to fruition and success. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who's going to start with our top five challenges. And again, we will curate the chat so that people who have questions will make sure we get to those as, as, as well as we can over the next 49 minutes. Sarah? Thanks so much, Rick. And it's wonderful to be with all of you from a beautiful fall day in Boston, Massachusetts. Those of you who might be in New England, good to see you all. Uh, so now Rick has really laid the foundation for us, talked about the foundation of fundraising strategy. We're going to shift gears a little bit, as he mentioned, and talk about the common challenges that we're all facing out there in the wild, so to speak. Um, and we know it has been a uniquely challenging few years. Um, we once again, even you know, this week, the events of the past few days, we're facing another global crisis, another tragedy. It's been you know, difficult and nonprofits have had to consistently step up to respond. So we only have an hour together today. So we had to limit 
the challenges we were going to talk about, though we know those of you out there doing fundraising work, philanthropy work on the front lines, we know you feel this deeply. Um, we are going to endeavor today to cover a lot of meaningful ground, though. The first thing we thought we would do together is just do a quick pulse check of what people are facing just real time in the audience today. So we just opened a poll. Um, and again, with full recognition that this is nowhere near an exhaustive list of the challenges that you might be facing day to day. Uh, these are things that came up as themes in our recent CCS Pulse survey. Um, so I'll get to that in just a moment. But take a moment, look at these answers. What might be your top challenge? What's really keeping you up at night when you think about your future fundraising strategy? And I'll give it maybe just 10, 15, 20 more seconds. Okay, let's get ready to close up the poll, Diana, and see what folks had to say. Okay, great. So uh, kind of a spread across the board. I appreciate the 22% of you, all of the above. Um, yes, absolutely. I think probably 100% of us could have answered this all of the above, but it's great to see that in the audience today. We have you know, kind of a widespread of things that are acutely happening at your organization. That's good. We'll tackle each of these in turn as we go through the rest of the presentation and talk about you know, some practical strategies and some best practice around all of these challenges that we have up here on the board. Um, so just a quick note before we dive into those practical tips and tools, we're going to be looking at some data today. A lot of this data comes from CCS's Philanthropy Pulse Survey. So I mentioned that survey work just a moment ago. The Pulse Survey, we've been doing it for a few years. It's really designed to gather insights into nonprofit fundraising practices that are driving your strategic decision-making. So participant responses inform the Philanthropy Pulse Report. If you haven't downloaded our most recent version that came out in the spring, you can do so now or after the presentation. And we just opened actually our 2024 survey on Monday, and it closes on November 10th. So would love to have the participation of many folks on this call to contribute to these learnings moving forward. So we're being as responsive as possible to the things that are really happening in your day-to-day -day work. All right, so let's get to the data. So in the 2021 and 2022 Pulse surveys, you can see here, these were the top five challenges that were cited to us by respondents. And in the past survey, it was about 1,200 different organizations participating. In 2021, it was about that same number as well. Um, so in order of importance or how much pain perhaps these challenges are causing in fundraising programs, you can see them listed out here. So we're going to, again, tackle each of these in turn and along the way offer some commentary and best practices. So let's start with donor acquisition. On the next slide, we think about attracting new donors to your cause. It's really no surprise, I don't think, to any of us on this call that this is the top-sided challenge. It's a constant threat. Uh, Rick mentioned the increasing pressure, you know, the donors down, dollars up phenomenon. So regardless of how well-resourced or well-known your organization is, uh, we know that this is something that's always on your mind. And we also know, all of us on this call, it's just not as easy as asking someone to support you. We know that several conditions have to be right and things have to be true in order for someone to say, yes, I'm willing to give charitably to your cause. So on the next slide is a framework that we often use with board members or campaign committee members or even you know, senior leadership as we think about expanding our thinking about who might be willing to give to our organizations. And we often say you know, a strong potential donor needs to have three qualities. Uh, conveniently for us, they all start with A. So let's tackle each one of these in turn. The first is affinity. A donor needs to personally care about and prioritize personally what your organization is doing, your organization's mission. Giving is a very human and personal exercise. If you're an animal rescue organization, but the person you're talking to doesn't like animals, you're probably not going to get super far. So someone has to have an affinity for what you're doing and the work that you're trying to advance. 
Second is ability. A potential donor needs to be financially able to give at the level that you're asking. And of course, this looks different at all levels of our fundraising programs. We know annual giving can be a great entry point to start to build someone's affinity and also gain visibility into their ultimate ability. And we know that as we grow into major giving or plan giving, as Rick mentioned, those types of gifts often come out of wealth or non-cash assets, not income. And in just a moment, I'll talk about how we can get to the bottom of some of that information. And finally, access. Do we know this person? Do we have access to this person? Do they have a relationship with us already? You know, perhaps they're a volunteer, perhaps a board member or senior leadership team member knows them. At CCS, we have this adage that people give to people. And I definitely say just in our current environment, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of misinformation. You know, that adage I think is more powerful than ever. Access to a potential donor is so important. Now, ideally you'll work primarily with donors who sit at the intersection of all three of these traits. On occasion, you might have two of the three and you'll be working to cultivate the other, but I do find this to be a really helpful framework when you're talking to somebody, again, a board member, a volunteer, a CEO, about what really makes someone a good and viable potential donor to be talking about for your organization. So you might be wondering, how do I get visibility into this? How do I think about these things? How do I get this information? Um, beyond, of course, just what I would call like shoe leather work of developing relationships, engaging in conversation with these people, which of course is going to yield the highest quality information, um, you can gain understanding of a lot of this through really good prospect research. So prospect research on the next slide is we know an entire profession in and of itself. There are remarkably talented people out there, perhaps some on this webinar, who are very skilled, are great partners to institutional leaders and gift officers. But you know what happens when maybe you work at an organization that doesn't have a full-time prospect researcher? Or maybe even in organizations that do, what happens when the prospect researcher is busy or can't prioritize your request? And maybe you have to put together a quick profile for a last minute meeting or some quick decision-making or strategy. And the categories on this slide are what I always personally keep handy and make up what I call the 10 minute prospect profile. You can always go deeper on these things, but this will start to give you a good framework for thinking strategically about how to engage a potential donor. So first, what is the source of their wealth? Is the wealth generational? Is it in real estate, so therefore not liquid? Is it relatively new? Is it the result of a recent wealth event and therefore perhaps not necessarily predictable in the future? What is their net worth? How might this inform their willingness to think about long-term sustainable support, uh, perhaps over multiple years? And understanding the nuance of your region and how people think about compensation in your market also helps a lot. So for example, for those of us like Rick and I in San Francisco or Boston, we pay a lot of attention to company sales, private equity deals, and so forth. When I was working in Texas, we paid a lot of attention to land deals and land movement. So thinking about that is a really good place to start. And of course, wealth screening tools that are on the market can help you with some of that work. Internally, what is the giving to your organization? So number three on the slide, this is probably the best way to identify affinity and someone's growing ability over time. Has it grown? Has it been consistent? Has it been flat because there hasn't been a specific request for increase? Has the donor increased on their own accord, even without engagement? What's the pattern? And if there isn't a pattern, how could we create an opportunity to create that first initial gift to your organization? And then finally, giving to peer organizations can tell you a lot. Uh, this, again, can be done with the assistance of well screening tools on the market. It can also be done with, again, just some good Google research work on annual re reports and donor lists. What peer organizations or other like-minded organizations is this person giving to? And how might that paint a picture of their connectedness to your cause? So on the next slide, there are a lot of resources available to help you navigate prospect research. Of course, some are public and free. Others are subscription-based. CCS, we usually recommend all organizations 
have a subscription to one of just the mainstream well screening services. You don't need all of them. Um, but remember, those should definitely be considered directional, not perfect, and not an exact approximation of what someone might give to your organization. In either case, research can provide a really helpful starting point for strategy. And it's critical that you back up any prospect research with, like I said before, the best information tool of all, actual conversation with a potential donor. That's the ultimate objective. So next, let's move on. Once we've done this hard work of acquisition of a donor, it's no surprise that the next biggest cited challenge we heard is ensuring that those donors stick around. And this is something we spend a lot of time talking to our clients about. So when CCS does analytics work for our clients, we right now are seeing the average benchmark retention rate is just 46% across the board, across sectors. So what does that mean? That means for every donor we're attracting to support our organization, at least one is walking out the door. We also know from our clients' benchmarking work that when we look at our clients' major or principal level donors, and typically for purposes of this call, we'll define that as giving above $10,000, about 20% of them, so one in five, started with a gift of less than $250. It's rare, and I'm sure this is perhaps your lived experience as well, that someone's first gift to your organization is their ultimate gift or a major gift. So retention, I'm so glad to see people really thinking about it and concerned about it. It's a real issue for our industry. It matters not only for our annual results, but also for the long-term growth of your fundraising program. So how do we retain donors? A friendly reminder to view these as cyclical, not linear relationships. So asking is just one part of the cycle. Don't skip the other steps, particularly the important act of saying thank you. And Rick earlier mentioned that you know, people slip away when they no longer feel connected to your organization. Some of you on the call might be familiar with the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. They do tremendous work. They partner with Bank of America to do just this great research every other year on high net worth philanthropy. In the 2023 report, the top reason cited by affluent households about why they stopped giving is that they got too many requests or the requests were too close together. So what does that tell us? That tells us perhaps the requests were coordinated. We were asking, 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 and not taking time to report back, connect them to the impact they were making, get to know how their interests were evolving. And the second reason is that they felt another organization was better positioned to achieve the impact that they hoped to make. And so that, again, is a symptom of you know, not reporting back, not engaging in those conversations and relationships. And sometimes we can take you know, our partners and our donors for granted and assume they're always going to be there. And that's not necessarily the case. Philanthropy can be you know, a competitive exercise. So remembering that this is a cyclical engagement, we want to move people forward, assume that, not assume, excuse me, that the last gift they gave to a certain project or a certain entity is necessarily the next type of gift they want to make. So that's just, I think most of us on the call are very familiar with this cycle graphic up here on the board, uh, but just a helpful and, and important reminder for all of us, particularly as we think about the importance of retention. Okay, so we've acquired donors, we're retaining them, you know, all is well, uh, we're encouraging them to give more year over year, so all of our problems are solved, uh, not necessarily. So we have three more challenges still on the next slides that people are thinking about. And you know, we know this work requires a, a lot of resourcing and a lot of things to do it well. Um, so Diane, if you wouldn't mind just moving to the next slide. Thank you. So we're, we've talked about acquisition, we've talked about retention, and again, no surprise that the final three challenges, which are occupying a lot of our energy and attention are around resourcing this work through staffing and using strong systems and strong data to do the work well. So let's first start by talking about staffing. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so these statistics at the top in the text are from a 2022 Chronicle of Philanthropy survey. 
Um, so 90% of fundraisers stating that unfilled positions are significantly increasing workloads, um, a similar amount reporting that the organizations weren't employing enough people to raise as much as they had the potential to, or perhaps as much as they were committing to, uh, to achieve an organization's strategic objective. Um, I can almost feel like the commiseration coming out of the other side of the screen here. Um, so it, it's a real challenge in realizing our organization's true potential, not just recruiting and attracting good staff, but retaining them and making sure that they're having fulfilling careers within the organization. And so I know there are several you know, board members registered for this call, um, you know, non-fundraising senior staff members of this call. So if you're wondering you know, what it is that you can do to support in the recruitment and retention of strong fundraising staff who have a lot of options, the, comp the competition for that talent is fierce, I'd say first and foremost, don't downplay the costs of raising money. If you have big ambitions, if you have a fast paced growth target, you absolutely need to do a thoughtful assessment of the time and financial resources that are required to secure that philanthropy. And once of course we've done that thoughtful assessment to ensure satisfaction of those who are already on your team, the icons on the screen, these are things that we're seeing more and more in the industry that are it really that are helping in this conversation. So encouraging and rewarding referrals, ensuring compensation is fair and competitive and attractive, offering flexibility. Um, this was a bright spot, I think, in this survey. That same survey noted that you know, over 90% of fundraisers really expressed the satisfaction of flexibility and highly valued it in their jobs. So high performing fundraisers, flexibility is a nature, it, there's a nature to that work. Um, and absolutely it's something you should offer if possible. Creating opportunities for upward mobility, creating a career path when you're within your organization so people can see how they can grow and continue learning, getting promoted, and making more impact within your particular organization and not having to go elsewhere. And then of course, finding moments to really connect our work with the mission, rather than viewing your fundraisers as a never ending bank account or an opportunity to you know, fill a budget gap. And again, one final data point from this survey, which I personally found encouraging, it's a good reminder, about 90% of the people who responded said that feeling like their work matters to the organization's mission was one of the primary reasons they had decided to stay. So of course, it doesn't downplay the need for flexibility, attractive compensation, um, an ability to grow and learn within an organization, but find ways to connect your fundraiser's work to your mission, and you'll be highly rewarded with an engaged and, and retained fundraising staff. So let's, as we round the corner here, let's talk about the final two points, which are both related to data. I'm really happy to see in the fields, there's just more and more appreciation that fundraising is a unique blend of art and science. Um, I think we can all appreciate and we all feel there's just more data available to us than ever before. Um, but as you can see, many of us are feeling challenged in navigating data management issues. What do we do with all this data that we have access to? How do we organize it? How do we ensure it's high quality? And even if we can solve those systems problems, how do we use that data to make better strategic decisions? So on the next slide at CCS, we have an in-house systems practice team that thinks really specifically and deeply about these issues. Um, you know, I've worked in close collaboration with our systems team on a variety of projects, but I also just know enough to be dangerous about data management, data governance. If there are specific questions coming through in the chat about that, happy to follow up or connect you to a resource. But there are a couple of things in general that we want to think about. This left graphic on the screen, I have always found this to be a really helpful way in working with clients um, before we get into this, the technical and tactical solves for things in thinking about how data issues present themselves at an organization. So often we're hearing things from our colleagues or board members or leadership like, oh, our data is just too hard to access or 
you know, gosh, we just, we really don't seem to be pulling the right reports to make decisions. And what we know is that's often just the expression of a lot of issues that are underneath the surface, structural and technical challenge in how we enter, manage, and segment data. So again, we could do an entire hour on this topic. Our systems practice team has a lot of great resources on how to think about this, start these conversations within your organization. But again, I, I think this graphic is a helpful way to start diagnosing what might be holding you back here. And if there's one final thing to say on this topic without going too deep into a technical presentation, you know, the best systems people, the best operations people that we work with in the industry really are approaching this now as a people challenge, not just a technical challenge. So if you're workshopping solutions or developing new reports, it's really best to utilize a change management framework before you jump into technical solves or additional reports or new ways of utilizing your database. The framework on the right is the framework that CCS tends to use. There are a lot of good change management frameworks out there. Um, but again, remember, usually data issues are people issues first and technical issues second. And then finally, assuming that you feel good about your data governance and management, and I didn't mean to paint a bleak picture there, there are a lot of clients we work with who feel really proud of the quality of their data and have done a lot of important and deep work on this, especially in recent years, perhaps your organization is in that category. So assuming you feel good about the quality of your data, what are some tools that you can use to start leveraging your data as fundraisers? So Three things I'll mention here. CCS, we often use predictive modeling. So we use predictive modeling to help our clients develop growth targets. We help them set campaign goals. Those of you in larger shops may even have some of these analytic capabilities in-house. Uh, predictive modeling is an opportunity for you to narrow your donor pool. Our analytics team often talks about predictive modeling as pointing you to the point of the haystack where the needles probably live. So it's directional, it helps in narrowing large data sets. It's a really amazing tool and predictive modeling, particularly with the use of AI, is becoming better and better every week, every month, every year. If your database isn't large enough for modeling or you're trying to start some analysis in-house, an RFM analysis can help you identify your very best prospects through scoring and aggregating the recency of giving, the frequency of giving, and the monetary values of an individual's giving. There is a great how-to guide on the CCS website that even includes a video of how to do it yourself. It can be done through a data poll and Excel. So this is something that is a great place to start, especially if you're a smaller shop, um, perhaps aren't ready to invest in an entire you know, analytics exercise, but you'd like to get a little bit better at this. And then finally, of course, there's wealth screening, as I mentioned earlier. That should also always, I think, be layered on to modeling or analysis, not be seen as the be-all, end-all of your answer about who in your database is a good potential donor. So, wow, we just tackled a lot of big challenges in a very, very short period of time. Um, I think I haven't been monitoring the chat closely, uh, perhaps Rick, you have, and, and you want to kick us off and we will take a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, I'll just make one final plug here before we you know, tackle a couple of these things that have come through. Um, we just released our 2023 philanthropic landscape. So we have the pulse survey, which is really about what you're experiencing on the ground. If you're also interested in the macro philanthropic climate, interested in thinking about how what you're experiencing on the ground connects more broadly to the philanthropic landscape. This is another great resource, some light bedtime reading. I think it's about you know 90 pages. It's chock full of good stuff. Um, but this is another resource that's free and available to you and your colleagues, anyone working in philanthropy that might benefit from that type of resource. So Rick, is there a question that came through in the chat that we might want to tackle? Yeah, the there was a bunch. Thanks, Sarah, for that. Uh, I'm going to give you a break and I'll take the first question. So uh, Great. thank you. The uh, first question came from Michelle Patterson, and this is a good news. We have a, if, if we have a wealth screening tool and Sarah, obviously weigh in, what's the next step in research if a prospect looks good? So this is where you go into a deep dive. And when we think about wealth screening tools, we're always careful about 
it's a screen. It's not your full research profile. It's not going to give you all the information that you need, that you need. It is the first, it's the starting point in this process. But if it gives you the signal that this is a good prospect, then you want to dig in. I don't know, Sarah, if you want to chat about some of the tools you'd recommend, but I think I think you have um, real estate screening tools, you have uh, real estate tools, family information, career information, all of those things are really important. You know, when you talk to about prospective donors, you want to know not just where they live, but who they are as people. So as you think about a deep dive, it's not just how much money they have. What do they do? Where do they live? Who are they? Where do they go to school? Where do their kids go to school? All of those elements, I think, are part of a much deeper um, prospect uh, profile. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't couldn't agree more with that, Rick. And you know, it is amazing um, how much you can accomplish outside of paid subscriptions and paid tools. <laughs> You know, and that's why I think the 10 minute prospect profile is a good framing um, and really understanding who someone is as a person can allow you an entree to a really productive conversation. And I mentioned earlier, you know, giving is such a personal exercise. Um, the most depressing statistic, I think, that's relevant to our industry, more people give to charity in this country than reliably cast a ballot. So this is a very, giving to charity, it's a very personal exercise. It's a very important way people express what matters to them, what they care about, the difference they want to see in the world. So of course it matters if they have ability, um, but that affinity piece really, really is important to get to the bottom of. And Rick, you gave some some really helpful you know categories to expand on the discussion earlier. The um, next, we, you want to do the next yeah, one? Yeah, let's let's do the next one from uh, from Michael. Um, so Michael asks, thoughts on if you would suggest including prospects in a direct mail or digital year-end giving effort to secure that first gift? Um, I would say, you know, absolutely. I think you know, if you're thinking about people who have been identified to you, perhaps, and Michael, I don't know how these prospects have been identified, but you know, if board members have identified potential donors, or if you're thinking about you know some people who perhaps have signed up for an email list or your newsletter, or you know, maybe they've come to an event, a year in giving appeal is a great way to start to get to the bottom of if they have that affinity for giving to your cause. So I think that's, that's a nice strategy in concert with others, which would, of course, include list review with your uh, board members or other volunteers or some of the additional research, perhaps running that new list through well screening could be a, a nice option. Um, but I think in general, we would endorse that strategy. So great question, Michael. Thank you. We have a question from Stephanie Casenza, who is the Associate Director of Development at St. Anthony's Foundation. Building our pipeline of donors concerns me as my donors here in the Bay Area and San Francisco are multi-year, but aging or moving out of the area. St. Anthony's Foundation, Sarah, as you know from being in the Bay Area, uh, is a wonderful organization. And, you know, Stephanie, um, that this is a this is a kind of a, a, a big concern that we have. I, I mentioned earlier, um, I'm in the Bay Area as well. And you know, we are seeing, I think we see, we're seeing five to 10% of the people have left the Bay Area for other places. You know, COVID has allowed people to work remotely. So they're moving out of California to places like Oregon and Montana and Colorado and other places. And, you know, we don't have, um, I, don't, I, 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 unless you do, Sarah, I'm not going to be able to come here with a magical answer to this, other than it is going to be really important to um, continue to steward your donors well keep them engaged. St. Anthony's has a great reputation. Um, building the pipeline of donors, you have to continue to work at it. But I do think given the kind of time and space where we are, then I think it's the engagement that's really, really critical. I don't know. What do you think, Sarah? Yeah, I I, I couldn't agree more. And you know, I think we were just actually doing a campaign closeout with a client out here in New England, a, a university and just run a very successful effort. They had acquired a tremendous number of new donors, particularly in the community. More than half of their donors to the campaign were first time donors. And the VP and I were talking about this retention issue and they really made a commitment, her and the president, to just keep laser focused on one KPI and that is retention of those first time campaign donors. They were hard won hard fought. It's difficult to acquire donors. I know we all feel that and appreciate that. And particularly in the macro philanthropic landscape, Rick, that you keep referring to. 
I think you know, if there's one statistic, one metric that you are keeping an eye on, it's where is your retention and at what level are people retaining? So that's often something we think about too. When you're retaining them, are they giving more than they gave last year? Are they downgrading their giving? You know, keeping an eye on those trends can really help you get ahead of some of the things that you know, are really happening in the macro landscape. I think that's great, Rick. So Andrew Calvert asks, you know, can you give some insights about the nuances between fundraising for operations, greatest needs versus endowment funds? I've got a couple of thoughts, Sarah. I think one thing is that, and this came up with a, an organization we were meeting with last night. Um, I think it, I think COVID has opened up a little bit people's uh, minds a little bit more around endowment that, you know, that uh, COVID, I think for lack of a better term, I think exposed nonprofit organizations, for-profit organizations to their financial vulnerabilities. It happened so quickly, so suddenly. We saw some of the same kinds of reactions during the Great Recession. And I think what that's done has um, really forced organizations and their donors, their board members, their leaders to prioritize endowment much more highly than they would have in the past. Do we, and not maybe not just endowment, but maybe the overall financial picture and sustainability. Do we have an adequate reserve fund? Is our endowment robust enough um, given to, if this happens again or something like COVID happens again, are we going to be ready for it? But more importantly, are we going to be better positioned for taking those challenges on than we were in 2020? I think that um, for organizations, I, I still think if you're raising money for operations, greatest needs, um, people who support your organization, trust your organization, they're always going to be giving to that. Um, but I think endowment as has probably become a less difficult request in the last couple of years. What do you think? I agree, Rick. And actually this morning, we were with a longtime client. Uh, the CEO is planning to retire in 2025 and they had just closed a successful campaign. They were thinking about what they should do, you know, in the 20 months between now and the CEO's retirement and the new leader coming in. And we were joking, there are a few board members on the call and we were joking that we had never heard any leader coming into an organization say, gosh, you know, I wish this place had less endowment. You know, <laughs> that would just really be great. Um, and so we were talking about that, you know, it was a joke, of course, but I think we were talking about that could be a gift that the current CEO could leave to mm -hmm. her successor, you know, really leaving the organization in a better place. We are in the midst of the largest wealth transfer in history. So they're really, this particular organization has never really done much focus on planned giving. They've done a lot of cash fundraising. So they're really going to make a shift toward non-cash assets, bequest giving, long-term thinking. They're going to use this as an opportunity. And of course, endowment is a great destination for those types of gifts. Should we, Rick, actually speaking of board members, should we take this question from Alex Krell about what is the highest and best use for the board to aid in fundraising? Should we tackle that one? Let's do it. All I, right. I, I would just say, I think obviously the board member financial support. Um, I also think where board members can be really helpful. And, you know, a lot of board members get a little, uh, a little, take a little bit of a step back. Like, I, do I have to ask people for money? But really opening doors and engaging with and connecting with new prospective donors. I think that's where board members is a really good use of their time. Hosting events, um, in like small dinners, maybe at their house or a, a larger group of people, but really being that connector. That's what I think about um, uh, in terms of fundraising, how board members can be really useful. Agreed, Rick. And we were talking earlier about, um, someone had asked the question about how we should think about newly identified potential donors or people who perhaps have engaged with us, but not yet given their first gift. Another really great use of time at a board meeting or kind of in between is sort of a classic who knows who exercise. Yep. And we've seen a lot of organizations. So for those of you who maybe haven't done this before, we do this a lot with organizations. It happens a lot in campaign mode, um, really asking donors to look privately at a list of names, usually identified through the development office and asking them to you know, rate how they might be able to engage. And to Rick's point, not everyone needs to solicit 
Um, but you can ask board members to identify, yes, I'd be willing to help make an introduction, or I can't make an introduction, but I can give you some information about this person and their philanthropic priorities. Um, so we actually had an organization, a museum we worked with that did that on a quarterly basis through their entire campaign. And it just became just part of the board philanthropic ethic at that organization. And really they've continued it since the campaign closed. Um, so that's another just really good, tactical, quick way to engage your board, ask them to identify um, where they might be able to help you make introductions or give you a you know, strategic insight on someone's involvement. I'm going to have to, I hate to do this to you. I'm going to probably have to punt number six to you from Abigail Neiman, because I'm not sure what the answer is, but I'm sure you do, which is a great, <laughs> a great question. Are there any new emerging stewardship materials that you think are effective in ways to engage people and, stu and not uh, engage with steward people effectively? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about this question, Abigail, when I saw it come through, I think I don't know if I have any you know, tactical flashy tools that I've seen that I've thought, wow, amazing. That's really game changing for our industry. Um, maybe I'm a little old school, but I still think the best stewardship tool is a personal conversation, a phone call to say thank you, um, a meeting, a tour, you know, a, just an opportunity to bring a donor close to what you're doing. Um, I do think one thing that's become a big conversation at CCS is, especially in education contexts, uh, independent schools, higher education, making sure that when we're stewarding donors, particularly for scholarship funds or financial aid, that we're being really mindful of DEI in those moments and really rethinking some classic practices that I think have been in our industry a long time, you know, pinpointing a particular specific student, matching a specific student to a specific donor. You know, there are ways to make donors feel the impact of their gift without necessarily having to tie it to a specific student's lived experience or a specific student's story. So I know that's a very active conversation in the education space. And we're encouraging our clients more and more just to be thoughtful of proposals, but certainly of stewardship efforts that are coming out of their offices. And really you just refresh and rethink those practices, especially you know over the past couple of years. So that, that's maybe another layer I would add in response to that question, Rick. You know, thanks for bringing up education because I, this isn't necessarily stewardship or materials, but the new president of my alma mater is young. He's very active on LinkedIn and it's relevant. And I wouldn't have said like social media is a, a good stewardship tool. I, I was at a, uh, didn't participate with, attended a different seminar, a webinar earlier this morning. And I think there's a little bit of data around, you know, effective uh, social media tools that can uh, engage and steward donors, of course, on a macro basis, not a micro basis. But this, uh, the president of, uh, of uh, my alma mater, he he does it in a really effective way. He does it in a very regular way. And the truth of it is, it gets you excited about what's happening um, uh, on campus. And you almost feel like you're there with him. So, um, and he's always taking pictures with the students and with faculty members and in events. So I think to be really creative around social media and really um, uh, active on social media in the appropriate ways. I'm, and he's on LinkedIn, obviously. But I think that's something that for, for a lot of organizations that we don't all have the time, but he almost makes it part of kind of his day-to-day -day life. And it doesn't get too much, and it's kind of just the right amount. <clears throat> so Lori Proctor has a question about, would you suggest engaging potential donors, especially when engagement's been low, before sending an ask or marrying the efforts? I would think, and I would prefer that at least without just kind of first blush to keep the, in, to engage first and then ask. I just think that marrying them for someone where engagement's been low, probably if you make the ask at the same time, it probably reduces the, the chances for a successful solicitation. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, you know, anytime you can engage somebody in what your organization is doing, the better. Um, I would also say, you know, if engagement has been low for a long time, this is connected to the question from earlier, perhaps someone has attended you know, a couple of events or you notice, gosh, they're opening 
our e-newsletter a lot. And maybe we recognize the reality of a lot of organizations. You don't necessarily have five gift officers at your disposal to put someone in portfolio and do a lot of qualification work. I think to the point earlier, you know, making sure that person is receiving an annual appeal or a special communication or, you know, a targeted you know, sort of engagement can go a long way. And that's where, um, you know, thinking about predictive modeling can be really helpful. Predictive modeling does a lot of work on affinity, not just capacity or giving. So predictive models, those of you who have used them, does a lot of thinking about, you know, email opens, event attendance, volunteering, markers of someone's engagement within your organization. And it's amazing who starts to rise to the top. I think most of you could probably tell us who your top 20 donors are and the people you're always keeping in touch with. But it's that middle band that can feel really squishy sometimes. And so thinking about you know, volunteering, event attendance, email open rates, things that indicate someone's really interested before they've given can also help you make decisions when your resources are limited. I, I um, love, I hate to say this, I think this would be the last question, Sarah. Uh, yeah, yeah. From April Newman. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for, uh, and other people jump into the chat, but does anybody have tips, thoughts on incorporating personal stories respectfully and without exploiting individuals and their experiences? This is really sensitive and a, a really uh, terrific question around that. One thing I would start with is that we often say to, um, you know, board members and uh, campaign leaders and others, talk, start with your own personal story, why you're involved with the organization, why you're excited about what the organization is doing, why you're giving to the organization. Because when you show some vulnerability as a, um, a leader and a donor and a, a board member, that really helps. That really helps everyone sort of see that vulnerability. And I think to the other point, you know, you have to ask people, you know, are you willing to be part of this? And without an imbalance of power, I think that's always important here as well. Yeah, Rick, I would just add, and I, I saw someone added this in the chat too, especially if you're working with minors, you know, people under 18, consent is really important. Um, sometimes you know, a student might not be aware that yeah. they're a recipient of financial aid. You know, really important to be mindful of that. We have a client in the New England area, uh, independent school. They have a group of students, a self-organized group of students called Students on Financial Aid. Um, and it's a group of students who it's voluntary, students receiving tuition assistance. You know, it's a group for them to connect with each other. They publicly announce their financial aid status um, and representatives from that group will often volunteer to speak at stewardship events. They contribute quotes. Um, so that's something that, you know, a lot of our school clients are moving more to. The other thing I think we're seeing a lot, especially when we're dealing with you know, populations that can't provide consent or minors really moving away from the, the personal story and toward aggregate reporting or framing language. Um, so really important, especially if for those of you working in schools, um, we're having a lot of conversations to not equate, you know, financial aid with DEI, with, you start to go down a slippery slope when mm -hmm. that happens. So I'm, I'm so grateful to see such like thoughtful engagement on this topic in the group. Um, because it's something that we're seeing coming up a lot and something we all need to be just really mindful of. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining. Sarah, that was great. That was always, it's always fun to do this with you. I don't see you enough. So I know, it's so good to see you and so wonderful to be with so many colleagues on the call. And thanks for your engagement in the chat. Sometimes it can feel like you're just speaking into nothingness. So I feel the engagement on the other side of the screen. Um, I hope everyone has a, a wonderful rest of your day. I believe we'll follow up with these slides and some additional resources, um, but enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Nice to see you all. Thanks, everybody.